committee meeting to order. Um, we'll begin first by acknowledging we have quorum here, but um, since we're not in person, let's do it appropriately. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch is currently absent. Um, Mr. S Mr. Martinez, are you present? Present. Mr. Martinez? Present. Can you hear me? I'm unable to hear you, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I, I could almost just now, though. I think can I heard you. Can you hear me? Yep, I can now. Yep. Okay, I'm You're present. present. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney? Present. Thank you. Um, and so with that, we have three of the four members of the executive committee uh, present, um, which allows us to establish quorum here. Mr. Campbell Gooch, I believe, um, listen, he's very good about just messaging if he's unable to make it. So I'm sure he is on his way. Um, and like probably all of us just juggling quite a bit, but we'll um, get started by reading um, our appeal uh, statement here. So pursuant to the provisions of section 2. 0.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of sort cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure the time and procedural requirements are met. Um, that will uh, move directly into the approval of, of our minutes. Um, is there a motion on the floor or anyone um, with those of us that are present here? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Anyone second? Yes, Sweeney. Thank you. Any focus? Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Any focus discussion? Not all those in uh, favor of Mr. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. In just one moment here, Mr. Campbell Gooch, um, <clears throat> I see your message to me here. So says he says that he is on the call but cannot be heard. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch, you're not showing up in my list of panelists here. Just one moment. I want to make sure I'm not. Um, I don't think, um, excuse me, Chair. Mm -hmm, please. I don't think that if they call in, he's because he can't join in as a panelist, that then he won't be able to um, be, you know, he won't be able to be heard. Okay, got you. Yeah. Um, okay, it's, so there's not a panelist number for, uh, I know like the, we're using the WebEx, those of us in front of a computer or an iPad or, or device, but we don't know if there's a panelist number. Or is there any way we, can, um, we can check on that really quick. Can you check on that, Todd? Or if you have an answer for that? And maybe the person from, oh, well, we don't have a host. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that we have the ability to dial in on this particular, but we'll check. Okay, let's do, let's do this. Um, I just told Mr. Campbell Gooch we're going to check on that. I would, if we could, do we still have that contact? I know the lady has been so lovely and helpful for us, and here's the day when we need her. Do we have her email or number where we may be able to give her a call? Todd, I'm kind of whispering that over yeah, here. I, um, I should have that somewhere. I am looking to see if I can get him uh, a number that would allow him to just plug that in and call in. So uh, if you'll give me just one second, I should be able to, to get him up and running. Okay. Hey, and Todd, before you do that, do you want to just take care of, let's talk about the electronic meeting statement and then we'll we'll leave you be for a moment. Sure. So uh, just real quickly, I, I feel like we're all starting to get the hang of this now. So in light of the coronavirus pandemic, Governor Lee issued Executive Order 16, which suspended the in-person quorum requirements for the Open Meetings Act. Uh, on May 6th, Governor Lee issued Executive Order 34, which extended Executive Order 16 until June 30th, 2020. Uh, so to hold this meeting, we'll need a motion that states, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, the COB Executive Committee is holding this meeting electronically to conduct essential business and protect the health and safety of the public. So moved. Second.
I'm not hearing anything. Are we still on? Neither am I. Chair Davis, are Chair, you? You're, you're muted. That, that'll always make it where you can't hear me. Sorry about that. Um, so I was actually thinking that we were just moving quickly, like so fast that I couldn't hear anything. Sorry. So Mr. Martinez, I, I heard I heard the motion by Mr. Sweeney, then seconded by Mr. Martinez. Any focused discussion? Didn't sound like there was any. So with that, we'll take the, the vote here. Mr. Martinez, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. And um, I vote aye as well. Mr. Campbell Gooch, we're work, working right now. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley. If you could offer Mr. Campbell Gooch some assistance, that would be fantastic because I'm sure he'd be uh, connected by phone, uh, the laptop if he could um, here. But we certainly do want his voice here on the committee today. Uh, we're going to, um, if you all would just bear with me just a little bit, we're going to go a little bit out of order so that we can offer uh, like relevant and um, helpful updates that might help inform later decisions and discussions here. Um, and let's see here. So the, and actually Director Fitcher, I think we still should begin here with the access to records update, and then we can decide from there kind of where to go there. But um, let me just share quickly as um, from chair perspective here, um, in the last just, I would just even say 48 hours alone, um, we received a lot of updates and other materials that we wanted to get out to the board right away. But for obvious reasons, before we make in any decisions, we try to come here first, executive committee, and then to the larger board. And so uh, both Director Fitcher and I, I've taken uh, several notes myself. We'll do our best to do just that. But please raise your hand. Let me know if you have any questions as we go through all of this. Director Fitcher. Okay, thank you. I just want to say in advance that I have a, a cold, and so I might start coughing. And if it gets really bad, I'm going to switch this over to Mr. Um, Assistant Director Clausey to finish for me. But um, so just bear with me a little bit. All right, so we're going to start with the access to records. Um, I just want to express that the MNCO, we have been working really hard and diligent to ensure that our core mission is upheld. And to the end, I want to give you an update on many meetings that we have had in the last few weeks in regards to access to records and crime scene access. So I met with John Bunton in the mayor's office, um, from the mayor's office, um, and Deputy Chief Hagar, we met on Thursday, June the 4th, to discuss the issues that myself and the MNCO investigators experienced at the scene of a shooting in North Nashville on the day before, which was June 3rd. The issue was in regard to the MNCL team not being able to go inside the inner perimeter area. <clears throat> Excuse me, in, in, inside the inner perimeter area to observe and was left to stand with the media and the general public in the outer perimeter area. According to the MOU, we have the same access as the OPA director, but in this instance, the OPA director stood in the media and general public area, and she was not inside the crime scene's inner perimeter, even though her investigators proceeded to go into that area. She stated that she didn't want to go inside the perimeter at this time, but she, but she usually goes in at all other crime scenes. Additionally, while at the scene, we observed multiple civilians in the inner crime scene area. We saw FOP attorneys, we saw an ADA, <clears throat> excuse me, an ADA investigator, as well as a TIO, um, Don Aaron. After waiting for approximately, after waiting for approximately two hours without an update on the incident, besides the loosely brief update that I received from the OPA director when she first arrived. I made a decision for our team to leave. And shortly after we left the scene, I received a call from John Bunton asking that I return to the scene for the update. And I declined that as I was already on the interstate headed in the opposite direction. And I knew that I could view Don Aaron's media briefing online along with the public. So the meeting with John Bunton and Deputy Chief Hager was to discuss multiple issues, including ECC notifications. Deputy Chief Hagar at that meeting gave me the name of Captain Jason Starling, who heads the CID unit, as our point of contact. And um, going forward, we would contact um, Jason Starling if we had it, 
issues with crime scene access. And he also briefed me on what I, what I, who I would need to contact through DEC, which is a field supervisor on duty if I had problems in the future. Um, and then, of course, ho you know, hopefully this won't happen. But if another officer involved shooting takes place, John Bunton will also respond to the crime scene to get a, get a better understanding of how things are designed to work. So we spent the biggest part of the meeting speaking about crime scene access and then a little bit about records. And Deputy Chief Hagar didn't have much to add to that area. Um, any questions in regards to that? If you want to hold them off to the end, that's fine too. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next meeting. The next meeting was on Friday, June the 5th. And the executive team had a meeting with Metro Legal Director Attorney Bob Cooper. We discussed the MNCO's investigators' lack of ability to obtain, to obtain records to do our investigations because MMPD had continued to deny our records requests, stating that the cases were connected to open criminal cases, and they would usually cite Rule 16. Um, and that refers us to, and then they would refer us to the DA's office to make the request from them. And so the DA's office has tried to assist, but we usually get the response that the records should come from MMPD because the DA's office doesn't have the authority to release the records because the records originate from MMPD and that the records are MMPD's records. So additionally, we've been denied ECC records, which don't belong to MMPD or the DA's office. Yet the ECC refers us to the DA's office who then denies the records request because of rule 16. So the common thread here is that the MNCO had been denied records on open cases on every investigation that we have because of this Rule 16 issue. Yet OPA, which conducts the very same type of administrative investigations, for some unknown reason, that rule doesn't apply to them. So we brought this up to Mr. Cooper, who stated that he would check into the legal issues that pertain to Rule 16 that have prevented us from attaining the records that we need to do our work. And, asked, and he asked that we send him a list of the records that we would consider essential to an investigation. So we did that, we emailed that. Um, the meeting with Mr. Cooper was very positive and productive. And I believe he has spoken with General Funk, at, you know, regarding this issue and something is being worked out to allow us to access the records. Um, and if you recall, I brought up in a meeting that we had um, last month that General Funk referenced a mentioning that if he got a letter from MMPD giving him authority to release the records to MNCO, he would do it. Um, and so a few minutes ago, about 15, about 15 or 20 minutes ago, um, I spoke to Bob and he emailed an agreement between Chief Anderson and DA Glenn Funk that gives the DA's office the authority to release the records to the COB. Um, and the, rec and the records are still subject to the confidentiality requirements, but he's, but the agreement states that we would now have access to the records that we were once denied. Um, and so I'm going to move on unless you want to talk about I'll talk about that now or you want to talk about it at the end of my meetings. Let, let's, let's, let, let's pause for just one more. Any questions yeah. on, on that? I know that's quite meaty there. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Any, have any questions about that? Is that all clear for everyone? Yes, Mr. Sweeney. Not a question, it's a comment. <clears throat> and although this is certainly a substantial move in the right direction, I think that needs to be memorialized in a way um, of the MOU revision as well. And I sent around some language just before the meeting started in response to what um, the executive director had circulated to us, where we could take what the MNPD and the DA propose and also incorporate um, referential language in the MOU provisions as well. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. I did see that myself um, just for the call here. We are we do plan to go through the MOU kind of broad strokes, but also prepare ourselves for the meeting next week when the entire board will have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, Director Fitcher, anything on your end, though? I, I think Mr. Sweeney's point, I think it's an important one. No. Um, yeah. 
No, I think I'm good on that. Um, I just, I did want to clarify one part that Chief Hager has also agreed to go to any future crime scenes. So that if we have any issues that we can work it out there. That's great. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's good news. Um, and it's um, a, a great positive steps in the right direction. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about my meeting with General Funk. Um, I'm sorry, I had a few calls with General Funk. Um, we discussed how his office can assist with giving us access to the records, but since they've signed this agreement, I don't have to get really in the weeds of that. Um, but General Funk has set up a meeting with the TBI and myself for this Friday to talk about crime scene access. Um, and so I think that hopefully that will, you know, be a positive step in the right direction as well. And we won't have any issues when it pertains to um, crime scenes. But I don't really know what that will, I don't know what that meeting will really do, if it's just, a, a, you know, to talk about what it is that we do and what we want. So I just think it might be um, a meeting where we're just kind of laying out some of the some of the things that we might want or explaining to them how the COB works. I'm not really sure yet, but I'll keep you posted. I'll have sure. an update at the next board meeting about that. Thank you, Dr. Fitch. Let, let's look at the, I just wanna, and I see uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch here, um, and perhaps he's gonna say something, maybe we're in the same line here. I think it's important while you receive that invite to go into that meeting with our own um, agenda items as well. Probably. Okay. And then, without a doubt, there's certainly an opportunity to listen, learn, and continue to build that relationship there. Um, but I'd be interested to know the board has an executive committee rather has ideas or just topics we feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't raise um, during that meeting. Um, I'm just asking that openly and then I'll yield to Mr. Campbell Gooch here. Yeah, Chair, that was kind of along the lines that I was going, but also I wanted to center that this still sounds like a runaround. Um, very much so. I think we've been clear in the messaging as far as just like what we need. And that's just like unrestricted access to records and crime scenes. So what I'm af what I'm afraid of is that they've been hiding behind Rule 16 and now they're just going to adjust and hide behind some type of slowing down or tortoise effect. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. The, the Dr. Fitcher, I think obvious reason I think there is yeah and I think you would agree there's space where trust needs to be both earned and then repaired here um and so if nothing else on behalf of the executive committee you can just state that you know we are interested in knowing that this is a living document that won't just be that you know black and white words here right um Mr. Campbell Gucci's piece is here we don't want our staff to have issues when something god forbid like someone involved in the police um involved shooting occurs. Um, it's just too much information lost here. Um, and Mr. Kamaguchi, I see your hand raised. Let me know if I'm um, the unmute you again, or you can unmute yourself, no matter. Yeah, I'm good, Chair. Got it. Mr. Martinez, I, I, I don't, I've got you here listed, but anything at all on your part here on this topic? I know we come in the middle of it, so it's totally fine when we wait to the end. No, nothing uh, right now. Okay, thank you. Director Fisher. Okay. Um, we, so the meeting I said, the last thing I said was that we have this meeting scheduled for Friday with um, the TBI. Um, the next, the next topic, um, since we're going to kind of push back the MOU, I just want to talk a little bit about a media policy. Um, I asked our community liaison to reach out to Metro HR regarding its media policy to determine if there were policies in place and limitations on departments with sharing information with the media, you know, when we have our media releases and things of that nature, to just make sure that we're conforming to whatever the policies and protocols are. Um, and she informed me that the only policy that's in place is Metro's social media policy. And since that's, and since the COB is set up differently, and has a level of independence that we there weren't any protocols on how we respond to the media inquiries that we received specifically. Um, and we have addressed the COB public statements um, from board members in our bylaws. So I think that there's nothing else to talk about in regards to the media policy. Um, I also want to talk about um, a couple other things before we move into the MOUs, unless you want to move right into the MOU. 
No, feel free. We'll no, hold just for a moment. Okay, okay. All right, so I had this under new business, but I'll talk about it now. Um, Miss Danita March had reached out to us. Um, she reached out to me, and she works at the NCRC, which is the National Conflict Resolution Center, and asked us um, to partner with her and the NCRC and the Juvenile Justice Center to kick off a program modeled after Denver's Office of Police Accountability um, that focuses on relationship building between youth and law enforcement. I told her that I was interested in this partnership. Um, one of our investigators, April Williams, had already been in contact with the um, Denver, that particular program um, manager in Denver when we were working on our, you know, teen advisory council and or youth advisory council. So she was familiar with the program. I think it's a great program and I definitely want us to be involved in it. And so she's going to, you know, send more information about it. They're just working on it now. I think the NCRC has a, a grant um, that they would be using um, and they want us to be involved. And so I thought that would be a great partnership to, to move forward on. And then also the Department of Health, um, the COB has been appointed to be involved in the oversight of public data sharing with regard to law enforcement. And all appointed parties have a work group meeting set for tomorrow evening to discuss the first steps and what, you know, what I guess to work out what this is going to look like and what the issues are. So those are a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. I also wanted to talk about um, the announcements, uh, under announcements, but I'll bring it up now. On Thursday, June 11th, I sent an email to Chief Anderson inquiring about the policy advisory report regarding the immigration and local law enforcement recommendations that we sent out. We sent those to him on April the 16th. And... Um, to find out if he had a response because we hadn't heard from him um, in regards to the recommendations. Um, he sent back his response to our recommendations on Sunday, June the 14th, and I forward those to the board members and the MNCO researchers for review. And I also reached out to Executive Director Martini of the DEC um, to talk about the one recommendation because there was one recommendation for DEC, it was recommendation number four, um, to talk about uh, you know, so that we could have more dialogue he, because he had a response, but I think that it was it, it, his, his particular recommendation deals with software. Um, and he said that his, he doesn't think that his computer system is um, able to do that, meet that requirement. So we have a few more conversations to have in regards to how they would be able to make some adjustments to their software to be able to help us in that way and to give a response to the recommendation. Any questions? So, Director Fitcher, let's. Um, and I don't see. Let me scroll up. I didn't see anyone raise their hand there. Um, thank you for all of this. This information. Let me just be clear here on the opportunity. Can you just name, give me the title again for the opportunity Miss Marsh sent our uh, our way? Yeah. Sure. Hold on a second. And, this, and what and how is it connected to the business department? I just want to be clear there. I, I think I missed something there. I, I didn't hear your question. Is it connected with the Denver? Did you mention Denver, uh, Colorado? No, they're there? they're they're going to model after that program. Got gotcha, you. Okay, that, that's what my. And I can send you the links to that program because she sent the links to us, but. Um, I can send you that information. So she has some helpful links about Denver's program and about the NCRC. She says the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center is interested in assisting your office in creating a similar program in Nashville. Um, it's the Denver's Office of Independent Monitoring operates a youth program that strives to improve relationships between youth and law enforcement by educating youth on their rights and responsibilities when in contact with law enforcement and educating officers on key aspects of adolescent development and de-escalation techniques when connecting you. Okay, great. great. And will this MNCO staff participate in it or um, will it be open? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, the MNCO staff would participate. Um, and it says that Nashville Conflict Resolution Center is interested in assisting your office in creating a similar program in Nashville. They have a team of mediators who work with juveniles that have had past interactions with police officers. They also partner with the MPD and juvenile court. So she's just giving me a little bit of background on the NCRC as well. 
Mr. Kimmel-Gooch? Thank you, Chair. I, I had a couple questions uh, in regard to that program. Um, and sure. I probably can ask them if I did a little research, but I'm just curious about a couple things. I'm curious about one, um, do the young people who are involved in the program have the power to actually change how their communities are policed? Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then two, like, how do the police show up? Like, are the police showing up as community members? Or are they showing up with their uniforms and their guns and the rest of their militarized uniform on? So I'm just curious about, because what my concern is, is putting my young people in proximity to something that has caused them harm in the past. So that's, that's what my concern, and I wanted to voice that here. Understood. And I think that from my conversation with her, they would they would spend more time separate, right, until they work things out on like walk through whatever the program entails. So you would have the youth, in, they would work through that program together um, and in, in groups. And then you would have the police officers working with the mediators in response to questions that they have. And then some point at the end, they would come together. And I don't know what that looks like as of yet, because we only had a couple conversations about it, and I haven't had time to get deeper into the research, but I do know a little bit about the program in Denver. But um, I will send you the email with the links on it, and she said if we are going to model it after that, but we're going to have some, uh, we're going to have some, uh, um, we're going to have some more work groups about that, and as well, um, the officers will go through training before they start working with the kids. So I can send you that information, um, um, Mr. Gooch. Mr. Martinez? I don't know if anyone has had the opportunity to read over um, Chief Anderson's response to the um, policy advisory report. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to discuss it, but I think that it merits um, some discussion. Um, Please do. Uh, I think there is a lack of, well, <laughs> frankly, I found it a bit condescending. Um, the whole response, the tone of the response, which is, I don't know, it's hard for me to read and take seriously if, if it feels like we're being treated as children. Um, but in his in our recommendation number three, he didn't fully address uh, part of the recommendation, um, specifically that the uh, sorry recommendation two specifically that they should be police officers should be required to document that they asked and provide a, just, a justification for the question of uh, immigration status that is not addressed in. Um, his response. So I think that merits a follow up. Um, and at the end of redeeming quality of this uh, response is he asked for our cooperation in advocating on this, the state level for a policy that would permit MNPD to hire officers who are um, legal residents of the US and not just uh, US citizens um, in an effort to diversify the police force. And I think we should definitely um, explore ways that we can partner with MNPD on that uh, issue. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Let me, um, and thank you for raising this so we can uh, certainly come back, but I, I figured this will be a topic both here and then next week as well. And I do believe that we should, without a doubt, uh, offer a, you know, a response that um, allows everyone on the board to uh, extend their opinion here, too. So um, first, let me just pause here, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Kamaguchi, anything that you'd like to add here or and or is there a recommendation about how we should move forward, move forward? Because I do believe that this likely is going to take um, a conversation that doesn't just occur, you know, within the space of our monthly board meeting. It might just take a bit more brainstorming to make sure it's a comprehensive response. Mr. Sweeney and then Mr. Campbell-Gooch. 
Yeah, um, I certainly agree with the tone issue. And I think in some way that needs to be discussed with John Button and or Cooper, Bob Cooper, as far as the overall um, relationship between us and MMPD, because virtually every response that we've received from the chief has been in that same voice. And for us to work cooperatively together um, uh, needs to be presented in a different way. Um, and, and then one thing to think about generally is when we make policy recommendations and we get a response back that leaves room for further resolution or discussion, I think that it would be beneficial for us to figure out both ways to do a written response and then a sit down where there are issues that can be discussed because at some point things can be lost just by the written responses back and forth. And if there's going to be a resolution of any of the issues that we recommend, then we need to figure out you know, what kind of vehicle we want to use <clears throat> where we can do the fine tuning, which may well require me. So it's kind of a general overall um, mm -hmm. sense of awesome, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I want to start by centering that this is the same old Chief Anderson that we've been experiencing for years at this point. And I think it's safe to assume that he's not going to change his behavior, whether it's with uh, community members or this community oversight board, which in turn was asked for because of his behavior from our community. Um, also, I want to center that technically he does not, or his officers, we do not work with them. We are the oversight above them, which it, which is the community's position because they are community servants. And then three, I think to counterbalance this, we need to lean directly into our community organizing and making sure that things like our email serves are high, making sure that we're doing as much popular education around the services of the community oversight board as much as possible and just organize around him. Because at this point, it just feels like we're beating, a, lack of a better term, a, bit, a dead drum, and we're expecting someone to act differently than the way they've been acting for years, the last three mayors very specifically. So I think that strategically, it would work for our board if we leaned into the community and we leaned away from Chief Anderson at this point. And when I say into the community, I'm also talking about leaning into the minority caucus of city council, leaning directly into city council and making sure like our community members feel engaged at every point of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Kimball Gooch. We're with Mr. Martinez. Uh, no, I hadn't um, raised my hand. It's okay. We're still getting a groove of this. Mr. Sweeney, I see your hand in raised as well. Is that still from last time? Yep. Sorry. Okay. Let me, um, so the director featured here, um, let's, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just, it seems each member of the executive committee, at least, it seems we're in the same spirit of, of feeling, one, certainly there needs to be a response um, to this, uh, you know, to Chief Anderson's uh, latest uh, communication, but also that um, to Mr. Sweeney's point that some of this uh, is being lost a bit in translation, perhaps we would say. And so we should follow this um, this written response also up with an in-person meeting. If memory serves me also, I don't believe that you and Chief Anderson have met in person, that he's instead always, always sent instead a member of his team or leadership um, in rank and so I think that meeting, first and foremost, as I understand, he's, is our chief of police should take place uh, as soon as it's certainly feasible. Um, Director Pitcher, your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, I haven't met with Chief Anderson ever. Um, I've been in this position since December the 4th, and I have had communication with him um, just through email um, a couple of times. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'd be willing to sit down and talk to him about this. Um, we can sit down um, and talk about our recommendations or however you guys, whatever you suggest, I'm open to that. Uh, Mr. Martinez, are you uh, willing here, and I'll bring this up, I can bring this back up in the larger meeting here, um, but we'll have the conversation as a board, a large, entire board next week, but if you would be willing, even if it's just for 30 minutes, to have something outside of that board meeting to ensure um, we have like a very comprehensive um, response put together, um, I, I would just ask that you be the member of the board that participate in that, although I know MNCO staff is leading that. Are you open to that? Definitely. I can connect with uh, Jill, Peter, and Liz to, to work on this. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. And I also just think it makes a lot of sense with the history and the way you led it um, from the outset, too. Um, Mr. Sweeney, anything on your side? Yeah, I think it would also be beneficial for him to be part of the team that would meet with the chief. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you, you up for that with a mask, Mr. Mer sure. Yeah. <laughs> you heard with the mask part, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Make sure. Safety first. Um, Dr. Fitcher, anything else on your end here before we? Um, move to the next agenda item. Yeah, sure. I wanted um, I wanted to bring up an email that I received. Um, I, I inadvertently forgot to mention this um, when I was going over my my um, information a moment ago. But on Monday, <clears throat> excuse me, on Monday I received an email um, from John Bunton of the mayor's office, and it was a letter from Mayor Cooper requesting um, the use of force policy review. It was an invitation. Um, and I've sent it to the board members, the executive staff. Um, I, I don't know if you guys, um, I've sent it to you since we've been on this call. So hopefully you can look at it. Um, and it was a letter that was addressed to myself and Chair Davis. Um, and it talked about the pledge that, um, that the mayor had signed on to. Um, and it also um, kind of, it, it, it talked about the use of force policies um, and national best practices. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it it mentioned that the mayor had invited um, the MNCO um, to be a part of this conversation and to work with Mr. Bonten and Eric Brown um, in support of um, the the um, use of force policies. And that's all I have to say about that. Do you have any um, you have anything yeah. to say about that? Okay. I do. Yeah, I will. And, and so I've asked, I asked Dr. Fitcher to actually send um, the letter that we received, uh, I believe it was yesterday, um, to the members of the executive committee, and we'll also send it to the board as a whole. And then, of course, um, I mean, the public should know about it. We'll post it there. Um, and Mr. Swinney, I'll come right to, to you. I did have a conversation yesterday, yesterday afternoon, with... Um, Mayor Cooper, and during that conversation, um, he uh, we spoke about um, the mayor's uh, recently signing on to, on behalf of the city, the um, eight can't wait. Um, that also impressed that he impressed the importance of wanting the COB um, to offer information, feedback, what we're hearing from the community, so that. Um, there's a very uh, comprehensive review and that there's also an opportunity and space for um, a, a fair assessment of how well are we uh, in the space of the eight uh, parameters and outlines have been that are in place with this recommendation. And that means, of course, perhaps it's three out of eight. And we know that within uh, the lacking five, there's language, there's policy. Um, we've been welcomed to be uh, a full member of this task force or group um, that will be uh, meeting, and there's no date set for this full meeting yet. But also, if we decide that perhaps there's um, a better position by us maybe being an ex officio member or that of a presenter or some other type of venue or vehicle, we could do that too. But 
I do believe in a space like this with the importance of this, that without a doubt, the COB would want to be at the table. I made no promises on that call except for the fact that I would bring it this afternoon to the executive committee. And then I would, of course, bring it to the larger board for a, a vote here. Um, Jill, does everyone have that letter yet there? Dr. Fitcher? Yeah, I sent, I sent it. I sent it to everyone. Okay. Got it. Okay, great. So y'all have it in front of you here. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. That that was kind of the main part of the conversation. Took up the bulk of the, it was no more than probably like a 20 so minute conversation. I did during that conversation, however, uh, ask the mayor for his assistance in ensuring that the MNCO, um, COB as a whole, you know, was added to the CJ steering committee. Also mentioned the planning advisory board. Um, Mr. Button, John Button was on that call as well. Um, where was at least able to hear and uh, on speakerphone here could hear our conversation. Um, he responded he didn't believe that was a problem at all, that we could most immediately be added to so that we had awareness. And I did share with the mayor that you know, prior to him assuming the role, we had absolutely you know, no issue being added to these things and would assume that we still had that same level of access and opportunity to contribute. Um, for the planning advisory board, I, do, I know that that takes an extra step or two. I did not receive the, um, you know, that will be a kind of a light switch done on that piece, but we will follow up on that because it is equally important um, we cannot be, you know, this can't be reactionary that the COB is involved when something ha bad happens, but rather that's how we we show forethought and leadership here is to add us and have us be a part of this in the beginning, especially Director Fitchard and her team. Um, anything else that I'm missing here, Director Fitchard, uh, bringing out up here? Yeah, um, so we're having a meeting with John Bunton and um, Eric Brown on uh, a meet and greet. Um, the first meeting, I think, is on Friday morning, um, and I'm bringing Dr. Valier along with us. So, and you mean, um, the, is the us, you, and Dr. Valier on behalf of MNCO? Is that what we mean? Yes, yes, that's okay. it. And um, we're meeting, which we're, we're just, I guess, from my understanding, we're just, you know, being introduced to Mr. Brown. I don't know exactly what what the um, details of the meeting is, except for an introduction. Okay, thank you. We'll come back. Um, uh, let me pause here. Any thoughts, questions? I know folks are both listening in, um, reviewing the letter there. Any uh initial impressions or how do we feel about um, accepting this invitation to become a member of this task force? I'm going to call it a task force until it's called something different. Yeah. And it takes silence to mean everyone's okay with it or we'll just put it up for the larger board to consider and that's totally fine too. Mr. Sweeney? Yeah, I think it's a good idea in the sense that you know, any of these organizations we need to be part of as to what part we play or how we do it um, is another question. I mean, you know, it, it may be once we put out the newest policy advisory, if we do, um, you know, we can say there's not really a need to do a greater review, that it's all contained here um, and it should just be acted upon. Um, un, unless we're of a sense that there is something much broader to discuss. So I would agree that yes, we should be part of it um, and we should accept, but then what role we play or how we act within it is a different or a separate issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Campbell-Gooch, any thoughts here? Totally fine if, if not, just want to extend the opportunity here. Mr. Campbell-Gooch? Yeah, I want to also voice my um, my agreeance in being a part of this. I think it's a great opportunity, but I also want to be like honest about my skepticism when it comes to these things mm -hmm. because it seems that we keep reforming, but we're not getting what we need, which is literally like transparency. So I just want to center that as well. Thank you. No, I hear you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell-Gooch. Agreed with uh, Mr. Campbell-Gooch. Um, oftentimes, these task force tend to take the shape of 
or disguise of inaction. Uh, action dis inaction disguises action. So um, we should definitely be a part of it, but um, be uh, make sure to hold them accountable for that, for what they intend to do. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I, I agree. I think in the best way for us to, I think exactly what Mr. Campbell Gooch is saying here, and Mr. Sweeney, as well as Mr. Martinez, is to be a part of it um, and to uh, be able to impact change uh, within. I, as a board, though, uh, to Mr. Sweeney's point, at Sweeney's point, I think we need to be prepared next week to discuss, you know, how we feel we'll be best positioned to make the, the strongest contribution. And I should share, um, sorry, I didn't remember to share this uh, as I was sharing the details of our conversation. I did, I did, um, I did say to Mr. Uh, Mayor Cooper, I said, look, I, we found that we are most successful when we have an opportunity to engage the, the public, to engage the community. So that may mean that, you know, we need to have a, let's say, a, a Wednesday virtual town hall to just allow people to sound off about how they feel um, the city is doing on these eight respective um, components. And so it won't just be something that we as an 11 member board are prepared uh, to respond to. Um, and and uh, he seemed open to that. And in fact, I noted that I think he's planning to do his own town halls, but I do think it's important while, look, we can talk about if we wanna be a part of that, that the COB continue to engage with our partners too. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I was just curious on his response to you promoting that because I also understand that it seems like no, literally no one can rein in a police department at this point in time. So I'm just curious about how his reaction was when it came to allowing community members a platform to actually like voice what they see is going on in their communities. Yeah, I didn't hear, I don't recall the, the mayor's offering a dissenting opinion on that. I, I don't recall him also saying like, sign me up, I'll be a speaker at that. But I did say that that would be, that's one part of um, the conditions I could tell you without a doubt that include the COB being a part of it, that we wouldn't just assume that the voices of this COB exist without wanting to reach in, out to the community. Um, and I even said that that may mean that in order for us to fully be a part of this, that means that we have to offer time before that first meeting for us to engage the public. I did without a doubt say that. Um, and by the way, Director, Director Pitchard is, was not on that call. Um, I got that call directly on my cell in the afternoon with not, uh, not a ton of notice, but we did schedule it. I did schedule it with his scheduler. Um, but I'm happy to circle back to make sure that's clear because I, I to me that, that seems like, um, you know, it's just kind of a, a pre rep for us. Is a, is a community oversight board. Anything else on this topic here? Anyone have um, thoughts here? If not, I'd like to just turn our attention back and we will get to the MOU here um, to the TBI conversation here. Director Fitchard, I know the last conversation, or and I think that was might've been the only in-person meeting you had with TBI, it was around um, just kind of a introductory meet and greet um, to establish that when we were newer, and I believe that was even predated you assuming the director role. Am I right about that? That's correct. The last meeting we had with TBI, we met with the TBI director and his team. Um, it was myself, we, Mr. Whedon, and um, uh, Attorney Pinkley. And so that was many, many months ago. I would say that was in September of last year. And so what we had, so at that meeting, I made contact with the agent in charge. His name is Mr. Winkler. And he um, was also, he was also at the, um, the location for the shooting that happened on I-440. He was the one that briefed us. And so Chris, um, I'm sorry, um, Assistant Director Clausey has been in contact with him. And so I'm gonna have him come in and talk a little bit about his conversation with Mr. Winkler. Okay. Yeah, I called him uh, probably last week to talk to him just to verify that they were involved in an investigation that we are also looking into and just wanted to make sure that it wouldn't, we wouldn't overstep our bounds or get into their way if we started talking to some witnesses. And we had a just a brief conversation, but he was very cordial, 
that they had already done what they needed to do for us to go ahead and conduct our interviews, it would be a problem. He passed on other information that I thought was helpful for what we were doing. And he did mention something about uh, MOU had been discussed in the past and that that did, uh, didn't, um, didn't, didn't happen. He didn't feel like it would it necessarily needed to happen because we were working so well together and that he didn't see where there would be any kind of conflict between us and them. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. And I think it'll be positive when they, you know, when we all meet, I think Friday. So mm -hmm. like I said, he was, he was very cooperative and uh, very helpful. So that was a good, a good introduction for me to meet him. Thank you, Mr. Fawzi. I appreciate that. Um, uh, they, Okay, so when we think about this TBI met meeting here, um, the twofold here, I want to, we, we do not do not currently have a uh, MOU in place between MNCO or CB, COB rather and TBI. Um, Director Fitcher, we spoke about this a little bit here, but it, you know, I just want to raise it here for the board. It's a discussion here um, around whether we see value in that in pursuing that. Um, I know we've even done some preliminary, you know, Discussion thought. I don't know that we've done a ton of research in that space, but I want, would like to open it up here to see if anyone else has thoughts about that and how that might be helpful. Could be helpful. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, uh, my instincts say that we should definitely be securing MOUs whenever possible as just like a default mechanism and just like a safety precaution just in case people do change. Um, and also the temperature across the country right now, we have a lot of cooperation on all levels. But my fear is that when that temperature changes and everything calms back down, then people, then the systems revert right back to where they were before, where we're not getting access to records and people are more apprehensive about working with us. So my opinion is that we should be trying to secure as many MOUs as possible just to make sure our relationships are set in stone. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Martinez, any thoughts on that as well? I agree with Mr. Campbell Gooch as well. I, I agree as well. And when we think about that, um, and, and then Dr. Fitcher, I'd love to get your thoughts here too. You know, think about, um, you know, crime scene access, uh, you know, TBI arrives and that they they assume authority even over that of MMPD. I'm, I'm correct about that? That's correct. So we would, I mean, to everyone's point here, do us a lot of good here. I do believe without a doubt too, the mayor even, mention this as an opportunity. I think we have an opportunity here um, that would allow us, one, to continue to build out in stone to Mr. Campbell Gooch these relationships. Um, I, I welcome ideas on how we can best craft that because I know these, these MOUs don't just fall out of air. They take time as well. Um, is this something we take into this meeting, in your meeting, just to say, you know, we'd like to just understand, are they prepared to sit down and work with us on this, even virtually. Um, does anyone have thoughts on that too? Because I, I, I think we miss an opportunity if Director Fitcher is missing with them, meeting with them already. Ms. Sweeney? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that MNCO would have to identify what it is that it needs and wants both from TBI. And that when they go to the meeting on Friday to say that you know, we like an MOU. We're, we're hopeful that there's a good, effective relationship. and think that it's best to be confirmed about it. But we'll have to figure out what it is that we want. I presume that, you know, the, the MOU with TBI would be quite different um, from what we have and probably much briefer than the one with Metro, but it would be basically a question for MNCO as to what it wants and then figure out how to craft it. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, Director Fitcher, any uh, thoughts on your end? Are you, uh, that sound like a feasible just path forward here? 
Yeah, um, I think that that when I spoke with Mr. Funk, he, um, General Funk, he talked about it, um, having an MOU with TBI. We just didn't get into the weeds of it. Um, I think that he wanted for us to have a meeting with TBI initially to just introduce what it is that we want, as well as um, talk about what it is that we do so that they have a better understanding of what's happening. Um, and and so I think that that's what the meeting on Friday is about. But if we can go prepared, um, I would like to do that too. Um, and I think that our, some of the things we would love to parallel the crime scene access provisions that MMPD have in their MOU. Um, so I, we just need to do some research on that before our meeting on Friday. Okay, great. Okay, great. Anything else here on the topic of TBI? Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, before, uh, we've spoken about the media policy discussions. We don't need, we, we can skip over that. Six is a big ticket item because I know it has just a lot connected to it. So let me just pause here. I'd like to go to eight first. Um, Dr. Valier, uh, Di Director Fitcher, feel free to introduce if you need to, but can we talk about the eight can't wait policy analysis and then we can come back to the MOU. Sure, we can talk about that now. Um, so, uh, Mr. Roscoe and I, a couple of weeks ago, as the A Can't Wait campaign uh, began uh, being shared more frequently, we decided that it would probably be a good idea for us to, to begin doing an analysis of um, the police department's policies. And we developed a report that focuses on each of the eight and specifically on the ones that are not uh, or are, that are not currently met by the police department. And we developed several recommendations um, that will go to the board next week at the board meeting. Um, the, in, for us to, part of the process for us to get for the report the board is <coughs> that the executive committee um, should approve the report as, a, as far as going to the board. Um, as part of the process. And then also, I think there's a discussion that should be had about um, whether it's expedited or what, what it looks like for the report to be approved and what the board's process will look like next week. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Any, um, yeah, Mr. Sweeney, lead me to it. Um, I, th I think this is an excellent report. Um, I think this is the type of product that we all hope to create. Um, um, but so it, it is a little out of sync in the sense that we would typically deal with at this point is a proposal that would be going to the board and then the board with the proposal would agree that there should be research in the development of a policy. And then we would go through our multiple steps of the hearing process for good reason. Um, that's not what is occurring here. Um, and I'd, I'd like to suggest something for us to consider and then for the board to consider that I've asked Mr. Pinkley to look at, hopefully he can weigh in here on this, is that um, we would propose to the board a suspension of the rules that dictate the procedures for the consideration of um, a policy recommendation which would mean that we'd be waiving multiple steps, including, you know, the original presentation of a proposal, um, followed by then a draft report that would be approved to go to the public and then a public hearing and then a meeting after that. I, I think that in this unusual circumstance that all interests are protected by a suspension of the rules because in this 
significant public and police comment. Um, that's part of the draft here. Um, and therefore, in, in this unusual circumstance, um, it would be appropriate for a full consideration and approval, the consideration of approval at the board meeting. Um, in order to do this, the rules would have to be suspended, which would require a unanimous vote um, of the board. I've asked Mr. Pinkley to look at two issues. Number one, whether the rules, these particular rules can be suspended, which I believe they can under Robert's rules. And number two, whether unanimous in that context would mean every member of the board or every member of the board present. So maybe Mr. Pinkley could weigh in on those issues. Uh, I'm happy to do so. So my understanding is yes, I agree with Mr. Sweeney. These these rules can be suspended uh, to have a vote at the next board meeting. And I also, my understanding of Robert's rules would be that it's a unan or unanimous of the board members that are present. So uh, just, we wouldn't need a full 11 board members, just however many are present, we would need a unanimous vote from those. Is, is there a particular provision in Robert's rules that says that unanimous means unanimous present, not unanimous of the board? Uh, I don't have uh, the the Roberts rules directly in front of me, so I don't have an exact citation for you. Uh, but my understanding is that it's unanimous of those present. But I will I will have to find my copy of Roberts rules to pull out and get an actual citation for that. We'll need to have the rules at the meeting because mm -hmm. that's a very significant issue. Because if we just decide that it's only those present. And then it's later determined that it had to be everybody that has to present here. Thank you, Ms. Swinney. Uh, sorry, Mr. Pinkley, is that something you think we can have uh, more of a definitive answer on by next week? Uh, absolutely. I can have you a citation by next week. Okay, fantastic. Um, Mr. Swinney, anything else you think we should just raise to this point or the others that you uh, related to the, the policy analysis here? Um, no, I mean, I, I do understand that Mr. Boulier was doing some um, uh, revisions to the report based upon the newest announcement of policy from MNPD two days ago. And I know that he sent something else today, but I haven't reviewed it. So I don't know if, if those changes have been incorporated. Those changes have, have been incorporated. I have not sent it out yet, um, but we will have a full draft tomorrow, including those changes. Anything else, Mr. Sweeney? No. Mr. Martinez or Mr. Kamaguchi, any, um, any questions or points here from you, feedback here? No. Thank you, Mr. Kamaguchi. Thank you. He's good about raising his hand when he has something, so I'll, I'll take that as no. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Valier, any additional points here or information here ahead of our board meeting next week you want the executive committee to be aware of? I don't think so. Um, we will be ready to send it to the board uh, probably tomorrow afternoon once we make sure all of the final revisions are completed. Um, and then we'll be, you know, happy to have conversations with any board members that have questions or do or make any revisions that board that do come up after that. And, um, you know, if it's decided that the approval will happen next week. We'll be ready um, to release it publicly and um, whatever else the board decides. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney? Uh, yes. Um, if it's appropriate, I would like to make a motion that Please. we recommend to the board a suspension 
of the rules for policy consideration to allow this report to be considered as as the final recommendation of the board at the meeting um, on Wednesday. Mr. Campbell Gooch. And your own news there. I second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, any focus discussion here? No, uh, all those in favor, uh, Mr. Uh, we'll, we'll take a, a roll call vote here rather. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Mr. Martinez. Aye. Mr. Sweeney. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion uh, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So we will uh, move accordingly here in informing and um, also offering that recommendation there to the to the um, the general board, the whole board there next week. Thank you, uh, Dr. Valier, uh, as, uh, as well as, of course, the always indispensable commentary of everyone here, especially our executive committee that allows us to make sure we're making informed decisions. Thanks so much. Um, if there's nothing else on this particular subject, then we'll go back up here to our final uh, topic for today, which is the MOU discussion. Uh, let me pause here, make sure I'm clearing all hands raised here. Mr. Campbell Gooch or Mr. Sweeney, do you have anything else here? No. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, Director Fitcher, uh, we spoke a, a bit here. We wanted to be thoughtful about the approach here um, uh, to also just recognize that we, uh, all of this will need to be discussed as a, a full board next week. Um, but Dr. Fitcher, I'll let you just kick us off here because we really just wanted to stay pretty high level and in informing the board. Uh, and then uh, I think Mr. Pinkley can kind of guide us through if there's conversations by section, including some of the revisions we've received. Okay, sure. Um, so um, the executive team of the MNCL, we have met multiple times to discuss some updates that we would like to see to our MOU. After working with the current MOU for the last six months, we have been able to determine that the MOU has some areas that aren't working for us, um, for us to be effective and to be timely in our investigations. Um, and so some of the issues have kind of essentially tied our hands and caused us to have a substantial time lapse in our ability to complete our investigations. So with that being said, we have updated the MOU with new language in multiple sections. The sections that we have updated are the cooperation and access to records, the intake investigations, the administrative leave and alternative duty assignment, the resolution reports, the policy advisory, the force review board and crime scene access, and then training provided by the department. So that's, um, that's eight different sections that we have changed some of the language or added some um, some extra items to, or change the language altogether. And I, that's all I really want to bring up. And then if you guys have some questions, we can dig into it. Okay. Mr. Sweeney, uh, I see you're unmuted, but I don't know if you, do you have anything you just want to add here in the outset? Um, I, have, I have not gone through all of this in detail, although <clears throat> Director Fitcher and I have discussed parts of it. Um, I, I do think that one thing that needs to be added in there and kind of reference to the discussion with the DA is, is that we have the right to um, documents and information and access to witnesses the same way that OPA does. There's nothing in rule 23 that prohibits us to do that um, I'm sorry, rule, um, rule 16. There's nothing in rule 16 that prohibits us to do that. There's nothing in the data matrix that prohibits an agreement that acknowledges that we have those rights. Um, you know, wh whether, whether or not we get stuff directly from the police department, which obviously has put up obstacles from time to time versus getting that same information from the DA's office who has you know, pledge to work with us if they're not interfered with. Um, you know, I'm 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 really kind of willing to take the information from either path. Um, 
but I do think that the agreement needs to specifically acknowledge that rule 16 is not a bar um, and that we have equivalent rights as OPA to investigate matters. And that, that's in the language that I had sent around just before the meeting in response to what uh, Director Fitcher had sent to us from uh, Mark Mr. Sweet, Director Fitcher, anything from you there before we go to the members of the board or the executive committee? No, I think that Mr. Um, Sweeney is correct in that we, this is something that I have brought up in, to the police department a while ago in regards to being barred from access inciting rule 16. I've never thought that this was a discovery issue and I made that clear and you know that they just keep citing rule 16 as a reason for um, not giving us the records. So that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch, Mr. Martinez, anything on our, your end here? Um, and absolutely fine if you haven't gotten a chance to look through all the components or suggested revisions here, just your general sense would be welcome. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I mean, I have looked over the revisions, but um, like I said before, it just feels like every single time we're making an adjustment, um, there's a direct order or a mandate down from the chief that makes an adjustment to the way that they function. So um, I would just want whatever this document is to also factor that in. Um, so my inclination is to just say like, I hope that this is as strong as we can possibly get it. And if it's not, I would suggest as a board member that we make it as strong as possible. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think I think a component of this is that we need this agreement now to be effective. You know, we we thought we accomplished a lot by having an agreement before, and and then as to how it was implemented, there were roadblocks. And, and therefore, I think this agreement needs to be blessed at the highest level, meaning that this comes about through a meeting between us and the mayor and the chief of police. And again, this is probably an area for Mr. Hinckley, but I do not believe that a meeting with the mayor, if we have multiple representatives or even the board, and with the chief of police is an open rec is an open meetings matter because the board's not taking any action. Um, instead, it's 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 getting the assistance from the chief of police, I'm sorry, from the mayor to get an effective agreement with the police department. But in any event, however that takes place, I do think the meeting probably needs more than just one representative of the board. And that I think that it has to include the mayor. And I think the mayor has to, we really want the mayor to come out and say, this is gonna happen and it's gonna work. And that the COB is going to get the same access as OPA. And this agreement is to implement that that this is what is going to occur so that the police department gets the message specifically and clearly from the mayor himself that this is going to happen. Thank you, Mr. Swinney. I, your point here, um, I, I absolutely agree with both you and Mr. Campbell Gooch here on the importance of this. I wonder too, Executive Director Fitcher, if we need to just, uh, one, uh, perhaps make that very clear by the line of communication is open, such that we just very plainly communicate that and email it directly to the mayor. We want him to be aware of the progress that we are um, continuing to hope to make, but also how we need him to be engaged. 
I would, I know you're connecting with Mr. Button and others there, so feel free to share it there. But I also want to make sure that he hears directly from the COB as well. And I'm happy to help with that too. But this is just too important. Um, and we shouldn't feel in any way that we're somehow um, uh, playing some some ga unnecessary game in this space, right? This isn't checkers or chess in my mind. This is just community work that everyone says they're involved in for the right reasons. Um, and, I, and I take everyone's points here, but I want to make sure that, again, we continue to put things in black and white. And it can feel sometimes like we are not making measurable progress, but there's a lot of information just today that should make everyone um, feel very positive about the fact that um, even folks who may not even want us at the table have no choice but to extend that invite because it makes a lot of sense. It's just the truth. Um, and, and, I, and I'm okay with standing on that point by myself, but I don't think I'm by myself on that. I think a lot of other people agree that you need the community oversight board, not just you know in reactionary times here. Um, let me pause the yield here to Director Fitcher or any other member, including Mr. Martinez, if you have something you'd like to share here too. Feel free. Mr. Um, Campbell. Oh, let, let me go to Mr. Martinez and then Mr. Campbell. I, I agree. I uh, definitely agree with Mr. Sweeney there. I think we need 100% buy-in from the mayor in order to get put, put some more accountability on, on MNPD. Um, it's time to stop playing games. Like we, we can't keep going back to the drawing board on this MOU. Mr. Um, I actually was just going to tell everyone bye because I have to. There's a rally starting in front of me that I'm helping organize, but I do want to say this right here. Um, I think at this point in time, we should just take in, take in the information, and all the pieces are telling us what they want, right? So, I mean, I know we have to work to convince people to work with us, but also we have a lot of community members that if they're well organized, they can force other bodies to the table and we don't have to do so much work placating. Um, and so I just wanted to, I wanted to center that before I left. I love y'all. I really appreciate the work that y'all do and I'm excited to keep working with everyone. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Appreciate it. Mr. Sweeney. Right. Yeah, one other thing that, that I would suggest or perhaps a way to further bring the mayor into the process is, you know, two of our board members are mayoral appointments. And I think direct calls from them to the mayor, not, not going through John Button, to, to make the point that this is a time where we really and you know to let him know what's happening, you know, at, at kind of the staff and the drafting level, but so that he can well understand from his own appointees why his voice <coughs> is essential and essential now might be useful. Point. Um, I mean. We certainly look, all of us have the absolute right to reach out um, uh, to our elected officials. Uh, I pause here though, um, Mr. Swan Young, because for two reasons. One, I think, and I take your point about them being appointed um, as such, but I also want us to be very thoughtful and mindful of just our bylaws as it, as it relates to having a uniform response. Um, I'm open to, to ideas on this. I think, um, I would just hate to set a precedence here because there's also those of us who come from the community and there's been times when uh, those of us who were appointed or you know by the community have had to yield um, to that of Director Fitcher or that of the chair here. But um, I see your hand raised, raised please, Mr. Sweeney. I, I, I agree with your point that there are designated folks, people, or people who have the authority to answer public questions on behalf of the board. But if we designate members of ours to do something, 
And I think it's the same sort of thing as asking Mr. Martinez uh, to participate in the discussions with the police department. We're previously asking um, um, Member Hildreth to work with John Button and the others in the task force. Yeah. So, so long as they're acting at the request and direction, carrying the message mm -hmm. of the board, um, I don't, I don't, I personally don't see an issue with it. Great. So let's take it to the board then. I think it's, I mean, especially that way we can get the reaction and thoughts of our colleagues like or member uh, Goddard and Dr. Hildreth. I think that would be absolutely worthwhile to put in front of them. Uh, Dr. Fitcher, I'm sorry, I saw your hand raised. Apologies. Oh, no, I was, I'm, I'm going to agree. You took, you basically said what I was going to say. I think that I've heard from board members and I think that taking it to the board um, and, and having a meeting with the board and the mayor, I think is something that they would be um, desiring and would, would like to have. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, well, we'll do just that um, and take it accordingly. Anything else on the MOU discussion, either from you? And I did raise with Mr. Pinkley, too, if anyone wanted to raise. Mr. Sweeney, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yes, just on the idea of, of the board meeting with the mayor as distinguished from the mayor being invited to a board meeting. Um, I, 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 I believe that I asked Mr. Pinkley to look at this before based upon other discussions that we have had with the open records officer at the state. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Pinkley has had a chance to look at it or discuss with him, but I believe that if the mayor wanted to meet with us as distinguished from him being invited by us to a meeting, that it's not a public meeting. Do we have an yeah, answer? The mayor can meet with whoever he wants. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, I don't know. So, have you looked at that? I have looked into that. I haven't heard back from Open Records, uh, so I will give them a call tomorrow to try to get a concrete answer as soon as possible. Uh, but based, like you said, based on our our meeting with Open Records Council previously, I, I don't see why this type of meeting would constitute an open an open meeting since there wouldn't be board business being voted on or deliberated on. Okay. We'll have an answer on that and then that should uh, be a strong um, well, one that'll inform how we move forward next week too, the decisions we can make there. Mr. Swinney, are you, anything else uh, there? I see your hand raised here. Nope. Okay. Director Pitcher, anything else on this um, point here? Not on that point. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I wanted to circle back to the mayor's letter and I wanted to bring up, um, I think you and um, Member Campbell Gooch brought up <clears throat> some points around the listening sessions. And I just think it would be you know, a fantastic idea that the COB hosts those, um, those listening sessions. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, no, I, I think, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was saying the listening sessions in, re in regards to, um, you know, this, this new um, committee, I think that we should be involved with setting up those um, listening sessions. Yeah, um, it can't wait. We're talking about the same thing there. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Without, and certainly, I, I may be mistaken, but I promise I thought I heard somewhere in the course of the last two weeks or so, the mayor say something about hosting town halls, and it may have been on a different topic. But I think, for obvious reasons, the COB, we would do this regardless. We want to hear from the, the public. Um, we feel quite removed having to be in a virtual space. And so even if it's a matter of uh, doing it by way of this WebEx space, um, I'd be interested in what technology allows us to uh, allow folks to raise their hands and be heard to dial in um, so that we can get their thoughts on this. Um, and Director Fitcher, if there's someone on your staff that would just be able to look at the eight, you know, and figure out a way, how do we allow people to, to maybe there's somewhere on the website that they could voice their opinion and, and offer some feedback. 
but I'd like to offer them as many platforms as possible so that we can, you know, say that we gave, gave as much access um, to having a voice here. But we can actually, we can look into how we want to include that into our response to the mayor, because I'm sure he certainly uh, welcomes a response to his invitation as soon as we are able to. We can work on that. Sure, sure. We have, um, some of my staff, we had talked about some meetings and setting something up similar to that. So we've already been working towards that. Great, okay. Okay, anything else on this topic or, or if not, we'll move to new business and announcements. Okay. Any, is there any new business or we touched on a few of them already, quite a bit of them, in fact, but are there any announcements or new business, anyone on the executive uh, committee? I'll go here first, would like to raise, and then I'll come to you, Director Fitcher, if you have anything. Okay, Director Fitcher. Um, I just wanted Dr. Valier to jump in about body-worn cameras. He had, we, he and I have discussed that about policy, and so I just wanted him to kind of give a little bit a uh, heads up on those. So we had been working on a body camera policy report after the release of body camera policy. Um, we, after COVID-19, after the tornado and COVID-19, um, we, the body cameras were deprioritized. And so we also, um, we had developed several recommendations on the policies in general, they are, they fit with national best practices and we didn't see any um, policy recommendations that were absolutely pressing. So as they were moved toward the back burner uh, from the city side, we also uh, focused our priority on um, other reports, including a use of including use of force. Um, so we wanted, just wanted to communicate that, you know, we have worked on those. We have, um, some analysis done on that. Um, and so based on the prioritization that the board thinks would be most effective, uh, we uh, are able to continue with that um, faster. Um, however, I feel, and I've had a conversation with Director Fitcher, that focusing on use of force is a good, would be a good use of our time right now, especially since the body worn camera policies are very consistent with national best practices. Thank you, Dr. Valera. Any questions, comments here from the board and the executive committee? Mr. Sweeney? Just a Mr. question for Dr. Valera. Um, are you saying that the um, uh, proposed policies or the adopted policies for body worn cameras that the police put out whatever it was now two months ago or whatever are generally based on best practices? Yes. And they've been scored by the Department of Justice and um, the they are very consistent with other policies nationally and the recommendations from a variety of um, policy and police organizations. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, uh, Mr. Martinez. Uh, that was my question. Thank you. Dr. Blair, anything else? <laughs> um, this, um, I do want to point out that it's not to say that there's no room for improvement. There's always room for policy improvement. And so we did develop and workshop several recommendations. Uh, but, you know, as we're prioritizing the issues and policies that are most important for, for protecting lives and protecting um, public safety, uh, that is not quite, we felt it was very important to be focusing on uh, use of force where lives are more at stake. Okay, so we'll raise this and discuss this the next week as well so the larger board is aware. Um, there's nothing else there um, to discuss. Is there any additional announcements or new business? Director Fitcher, anything else on your end? Nothing else on my end. Okay, uh, any, um, anything else from the members of the executive committee here? Mr. Martinez, Mr. Sweeney? No. Okay. Um, Mr. No. 
Okay. And, and so, look, it is um, it's 5.30 in the evening here. I also just want to recognize and I'll raise this with the board. I, I want to create space um, and just acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is um, that it seems as, as though um, our country has stopped hitting the snooze button. button. Uh, a lot of us, and we're having important conversations, but also people are expressing um, their position, their feelings um, with these nonviolent protests. And I think... Um, look, uh, many of those attendees are supportive of collaboration between the COB, and MMPD, lead, local and elect elected leadership. And so we will continue to offer open line for the public to express those opinions, but we'll also just continue to do what we're doing today, which is create as much as we can the policies, the MOUs, the recommendations needed for success. Um, we're not slowing down. This work has uh, meaningful and purposeful work, and I want the community to know that, but also think it's important that our board continue to feel encouraged that this work is, is important. It really is. It's hard because it's important. There continues to be uh, boulders that are dropped by invisible spaces because it's that important. <coughs> so be successful here, too. Um, and I also just uh, want to extend myself here, look, from just the DNI capacity to members of the executive committee. I'm going to say this to the board. If I can be helpful in just sharing resources that I found helpful as I continue on my own change journey here and in, in awareness, let me know, and I'm happy to share that out too. Um, but that's uh, that. Those are the updates from us today. Thanks everyone for the patience here, um, for all the MNCO staff <coughs> on the line with us here, um, and uh, with that. I will accept, uh, if there is one, a motion here to adjourn, or adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Anyone second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, any focus discussion on that? There never is on that one. But <laughs> uh, with that, we'll take a, a roll call vote. Mr. Martinez? Aye. Mr. Sweeney? Aye. And uh, Chair David, I vote uh, I as well. Thank you, for everyone. We are adjourned at 5.34 p.m. We'll see everyone next week um, on June. Uh, what is that going to be? That is June 24th uh, at 4 p.m. for our, our board meeting, our general board meeting. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.